Ecclesiastes chapter 4. <clears throat> Read the whole chapter. So I returned and considered all the oppressions that are done under the sun. And behold the tears of such as were oppressed. And they had no comforter. And on the side of their oppressors there was power, but they had no comforter. Wherefore I praise the dead which are already dead more than the living which are yet alive. Yea, better is he than both they which hath not yet been, who hath not seen the evil work that is done under the sun. Again I considered all travail and every right work, that for this a man is envied of his neighbor. This also, this is also vanity and vexation of spirit. The fool foldeth his hands together and eateth his own flesh. Better is an handful with quietness than both the hands full with travail and vexation of spirit. Then I returned and I saw vanity under the sun. There is one alone, and there is not a second. Yea, he hath neither child nor brother. Yet is there no end of all his labor. Neither is his eye satisfied with riches. Neither saith he, for whom do I labor and bereave my soul of good? This is also vanity, yea, it is a sore travail. Two are better than one, because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. Again, if two lie together, then they, shall, then they have heat. But how can one be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Better is a poor and a wise child than an old and foolish king who will no more be admonished. For out of prison he cometh to reign, whereas also he that is born in his kingdom becometh poor. I considered all the living with which walk under the sun, with the second child that shall stand up in his stead. There is no end of all the people, even of all that have been before them. They also that come after shall not rejoice in him. Surely this also is vanity and vexation of spirit. <clears throat> so as we've read through Ecclesiastes thus far, we've seen Solomon going through his little experimental stage, trying to uncover, trying to discover the ways of men upon this earth. We saw that he, he brought to counsel the idea that the world and understanding how it all works together, uh, the nature of things, the, the, uh, the natural world as we know it, is vanity for men to try to discover and try to understand of it. He almost dismissed it at that point when he realized that the natural world is beyond wonder, beyond comparison. And though Solomon learned many, many great things about it, I'm sure very quickly he discovered that, that it's beyond understanding, it's beyond knowing. If only man had done better records to keep of the wonders of nature and to have them to behold and to be reread. Although then you might have volumes upon volumes upon volumes which would never be read anyways. Because the natural world that was created of God is inexplicable. It's, un, it's not understandable. It's, it's just so wonderful and, and, and beautiful and great. So Solomon began to understand the, the carnality of it all and, and men's perspective of things. And we know that he, he began to uh, endeavor to, to try different things of this carnal world in order that he might uncover the truth of it all. And so he went to mirth, and so he went to wine, and so he went to seek after great works and great possessions. And he built from the ground up this great business that enthralled many people, took care of many families. He had children born unto his servants as he did this work. The next and last week we talked about the seasons of everything. And Solomon kind of brings it all around to this idea that it is so vain, there is so much vanity involved, that we need to just kind of roll with these things in life and not get so caught up in them. We see to everything there is a season and to a time to every purpose in heaven. And he says there's a time to born, a time to die, and he continues, a time to get and a time to lose. And he continues with all these things that all have their time and their proper place in this 
life. And God is in control of these things. He is in control of these things. And thereby, for us to try to make time something that we can harness and we can use and we can take advantage of is just foolishness because time is reciprocal. It's repeating. It's something that we will always be constrained by and caught within until we leave this world. And there's time no more, the Bible says. But well, I think that's a finality of things. But next to eternity, what, what is time? Would we even keep track by calendar? Who knows? But he brings it to chapter 4, and he begins to talk about impre- uh, oppression. I return and consider all the oppression. And oppression is this. It's, it's a prolonged, it's a cruel and unjust treatment. And it's usually done in exercise of authority. When authority is putting cruelty and unjust treatment upon somebody that is beneath them in authority. That is referred to as oppression. The strong oppress the weak. The powerful oppress those that are not mighty. Those that are of low estate. And this is how it often works with men. But with God it's not so. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 11. It says, He hath made everything beautiful in his time. Verse 14 says this, I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing shall be put to it, nor anything taken from it. And God doeth it that men should fear him. And there in verse 22 it says, Wherefore I perceive that there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his own works, for that is his portion. For who shall bring him to see what shall be after him? And here God is explaining that while men tend to oppress, God tends to create everything beautiful, everything eternal and with eternal purposes to the end that men would fear him that they could receive their portion of what God has created. He created the world to be enjoyed by us that those that he enjoys most being mankind would live in it, would dwell in it, would flourish within the natural world that he created. And God doesn't oppress. God doesn't push down mankind, but rather glorifies them as a special case, a special person, a special being within his creation. And we should rejoice in the works that we have. But our present reality is that we have this beautiful, this purposeful world that we can rejoice in. God has given us this so that we can rejoice in it. And But the reality of it... Uh, all at the very rudimentary level, the very base of it all, is that though we are esteemed above, we are nothing in comparison to beasts, really. Uh, the Bible says this. It says in uh, 3 verse 18, because God refers to us as the creature, right? He said, I said in my heart concerning the estate of the sons of men. So the position of the sons of men, that God might manifest them. God might make them plain. He might He might show me the estate of men and where they stand. What is their position? And that they might see that they themselves are beasts. We're, we're creatures. We're created by God. And we're only greater than the beasts in so much as he made it so. He declared it so. He spoke it so. He gave us that lifted estate. But look at this. Verse 19. For that which befalleth the sons of men befalleth beasts. Even one thing befalleth them. As the one dieth, so dieth the other. Yea, they have all one breath, so that a man hath no preeminence above a beast. For all is vanity. All go to one place. All are of the dust. All turn to dust again. Who knoweth the spirit of man that goeth upward and the spirit of the beast that goeth downward? God here is saying, he's saying, uh, men and beasts, what differeth them? They're all going to live and breathe and die and turn to dust. The spirit of man goeth up, the spirit of beast goeth down. Who knoweth this but God himself? Who knoweth how these things work? And the reality is, is that the only one that knows the up and down of the spirit is God himself. But since this is all vanity from our perspective, these statements that Solomon's making are simply him just putting the gravity to it. Why do you think you're so special? Why do you think you're so high lifted? Why do you think there's anything great above you? If it were not so in God's word, what would you have? You're no greater than a beast. You're going to turn to dust. You're going to return to dust. Your spirit, who knows what would happen afterward? From the carnal mind, from the carnal perspective, is just poof. That's it. You're done. You're no different than the dog. You're no different than any other beast. And God knows these things with great understanding. He knows the ups and downs of the spirit. And while we begin to learn and try to comprehend and grasp all of God's creation and how man is intri- man's intricities within it, man's workings within the creation of God, um, it's just so beyond us to understand and comprehend 
these things. And hence there is a verse, like verse 22 there in chapter 3, where it says, Wherefore I perceive that there is nothing better that a man should rejoice in his own works, for that is his portion. For who shall bring him to see what shall be done after him? In other words, once you turn to dust, who's going to bring you forth to see what following after you? Uh, dust you are, dust you shall return. It's just over as far as this world is concerned. So therefore, while you're here, while you're indwelling in this vanity, I think the bottom line is this. Don't overcomplicate things. Don't overthink things. Rejoice in your portion. There is nothing better than to do that. Be thankful. Be rejoicing. Be happy with what you have is what's being highlighted here. Because you're dust. Because as far as this world is concerned, you go into the same dirt that the dog goes into. You go in the same dirt that all the creatures, the, the, the plants go into. Everything that is a created thing is from dust and will return unto dust. Therefore, while you're here, enjoy it. Therefore, while you're here, rejoice in the portion that God has allowed for you. And there's nothing better than that. <clears throat> but what's, what's one of the problems that we have in rejoicing in our own labors? You know a very famous verse, we use it all the time. It says, by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of ourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Amen. So here we have Solomon explain that we are to rejoice in our labors, we are to rejoice in our works, and yet salvation is almost completely contrary to that because it says not of works as any man should boast. And how often do we have at the door we, we deal with this because man is so bent to work, to work, to work. I was taught all my life, you need to work to get what you want. You need to work to achieve your goals. You need to work, 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 work. And it's true. If all this life was was to, was to live the life just the same as any beast and then die and turn to dust, then the best thing that we could do, nothing better, would be to work and to enjoy. But we know there's something after that. And when it comes to the afterlife, works have nothing to do with it. In fact, works cause us to boast, and that's a hindrance to the gospel. Men are bent, right? God put not eternity in our hearts, but he put the world in our hearts. And that's what we are constrained in. That's what we are confined in. And that's why the best thing quite often we can do when we bring the scriptures unto people is quite often we'll give illustrations that apply these scriptural truths to a real life example that they can grasp because men don't know more than what they can see, touch, taste, feel, right? It's hard to tell people that your creator came to this world and he died on a cross and he rose again and he's now in heaven pleading you to join him there. That is not something that the carnal man can grasp. And that's why the best thing that a soul owner can do is to have these scriptures, lay them out plainly that they can receive them by faith. But when there's a hindrance, when their carnal mind is having, having an apprehension to the truths that are coming to them, grab a hold of that carnal mind and explain something to it to allow the spirit to essentially sneak in the back door and grab a hold of that soul, grab a hold of that spirit and have it come to life. You give the carnal mind something that it will feed on, something that it will understand, something that it will comprehend. So eventually the mind, the flesh that has enmity with God will agree with the spirit that is testifying of the salvation that is given to them. And when they agree, that's the repentance that turns the unbelief into belief. And they're, they're born again, right? They call upon the name of the Lord and they receive salvation because they have agreed with what the Spirit is telling them. And those two unite in that act of faith. But like I said, this is a major problem about how we live our lives and how salvation is dictated and, that, and the fact that they're, they're contrary. Solomon's journey to understand this call, carnal mind, he went out and he worked. He started off seeking pleasure. He started seeking wine and mirth. But then he went about to toil and to labor and to try with his hands and to work with his hands in order to build an empire that anyone in the world would, would, would just drool all over themselves to receive because it was so great and so vast the works that Solomon had made. So he lived that dream. He lived in the flesh what every man desires, what every man wants, what every man would seek to have and would love to have accumulating then this great success, this great wealth, and this great fame, which from the carnal perspective is all great things. But in the end, after he had done all this, he just concluded with this, it's all vanity. And so men should take heed to that and understand that, hey, I can go and chase after the high paying job. I can go and chase after the education. I can go and chase after um, the, the women, the cars, the, 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 the sports. The, I can go chase after all this stuff. And even if I were to get it all to the lengths that Solomon did, 
It would be vanity. It would cause depression. That wisdom of knowing and having and beholding and embracing, all of those things would just drive me to misery. And we can learn that without having to live it, praise be God, because none of us are going to live, live deliciously like Solomon had. And so he wrote in the end that all is vanity, all of these works of the flesh. So don't take this too seriously. Do you have lots? Rejoice in that. Do you have little? Rejoice in that. Are you in the middle? Rejoice in that. We need to embrace and love and rejoice in the life that God has given us and be content therein. So after Solomon goes through this journey of understanding and he comes to the realization that times are not something that he can have a grasp of or control of and God just wants nothing better than in this life, in this flesh that I am currently living, it's nothing better. There is nothing better than for me to rejoice in my own works. That is the portion that God has allowed me. And when he comes down from this, as it says in chapter 4 and verse 1, it says, so I return. So he returned from that journey. He returned from that, that, that trial that he went through. He returned from that experiment. And he considered all the oppressions that are done under the sun. And behold, the tears of such as were oppressed. They had no comforter. And on the side of their oppressors was power, but they had no comforter. And so again, Solomon is looking back, stepping down from the pinnacle, and he's understanding the oppressions, having seen both sides. He understands that human authority often hurts, it harms, it forces down unjustly the weak, the poor, and it treats them with cruelty. And that's what the oppressions are upon the poor, upon those that are crying the tears, upon those that are oppressed. But when he looks back, he sees this, and it's a very interesting um, thing to notice. He says, the tears of the oppressed, those that are oppressed, have no comforter. But then he says this, and on the side of their oppressors was power, but they had no comforter. So just as men on this world are no different than a dog in order that they both return to the same dust, right? In the same way, the oppressor and the oppressed end up in the same spot with no comforter, with no spirit true comforter, right? How often do we see that term comforter? And whenever I hear it, I always think that's the spirit of God. That's what they're missing. They're missing the comforter, the comforter. I will send thee another comforter. And both these are on the same plane, whether you're rich or poor, whether you're the boss or those that are under him, whether you're oppressing or you're the oppressed, you have no comforter in this life. We see also here just how fickle man is. Just how easily we sway from one to the other. Our state has remained the same. We have no comforter. And yet whether you're comforted, or whether you're, sorry, oppressed, or whether you're the oppressor, the same is true in that our position tends to dictate what our person is. So as soon as I become the oppressor, I'm going to start oppressing. As soon as I start to raise in position, I start to become the authority, I'm going to oppress, I'm going to put down. And we know of, we know of religions that, that serve this way, where when they're on the other hand, underhand, they'll be very meek and mild, and they'll seem like they're oppressed. And this isn't just one that I'm talking about. It's almost all world religions. But as soon as they start to gain power and numbers and authority, and they become the majority, suddenly they go from being being oh so poor and oppressed and, and, and impoverished and just weak to being strong and iron-fisted and firm with those that they're now on top of. That's the fickleness of man. That's how we, we, we change so suddenly because the Bible, or that, that old proverb says, you know, absolute, or power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. But we have an even better proverb in uh, the Bible, Proverb 28, and in verse 3, where it says, A poor man that oppresseth the poor is like a sweeping rain which leaveth no food. And so we would think that the poor man would be more kind to the poor because they're in the same position. But there's one, obviously, that's poor and one's that poorer. And the oppression of that one alike is, is the same. It, there is no difference if he were super rich. He's going to sweep away and take away all things just as a flood coming through to destroy those that are under him. The poor oppressing the poor is what we see here. The fickleness of man in order that when they're in power, they will automatically persecute. 
And so in verse 2, back in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, we see Solomon in his frustration seems to suggest that not being born or having passed away would have been better unto him. We've seen this many times in the Bible. Here's Solomon's case. Wherefore I praise the dead, which are already dead, more than the living, which are yet alive. Yea, better is he than both they, which hath not been, who hath not seen evil work that is done under the sun. I'm not sure about this statement that Solomon's making, or if it's just a, if it, if it's a true statement, or whether it's just a statement of his heart, where he's emotionally presenting the idea that some days it's so rotten for him, seeing the oppression, seeing the wickedness in the world, that it were better for him if he were just never born. It'd be better for him were he to pass away and just leave this earth and return to the dust as he presents it here. And how often have we had the same thought? How often have we perhaps been thinking about uh, children or lost loved ones or situations and we're like, you know, I, it's so rough for me, I just wish I wasn't born. Or, or it's better to not bring that child that was lost into the world because, because now, now they're not going to see just how terrible this world is. And we all have these strange ways of, of, of rationalizing loss and suffering and situation. And we get that mindset that, oh, it would be better if I was just not born. It would be better for this one if he were just not born. And we only have in the Bible the record of one that it would be better if he were just not born. And that's Judas Iscariot. That's the reprobate. That's the false prophet that, that's, now, that's now burning it. How it would have been better for him that he were not born. But I don't think it's a position that Christians need to take. I don't think it's a position that we need to adopt. We don't need to have that type of depression that just thinks, oh, I wish I were dead. But in Solomon's case, he's, he's just emphasizing the frustration that he's feeling, seeing that whether we're rich or we're poor, whether we're oppressed or the oppressor, we are all the same in that we react the same to these situations. And when we're in power, we're going to corrupt, we're going to hurt, we're going to harm others. Men's nature ensures this. Even in our labors, where we should be rejoicing in our own, we tend to look at others and that's where it grows that great seed of wickedness in our heart. That's where it grows that envy. The Bible says, comparing yourselves amongst yourselves, ye are not wise. And so when Solomon walks through this passage and he starts to talk about how it's better for us, there's nothing better than that we should rejoice in our own labor, what he's saying is look at what you got and just be thankful for it. That is your portion. That is his portion, what he has received because of his own labor. But men tend to do this. We tend to look upon others and we tend to grow in envy. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 27 verse 4, wrath is cruel and anger is outrageous, of course, but who is able to stand before envy? The Bible records that Jesus was committed to the council because of envy, because the religious Jews had envy towards him and towards his works and that they were greater than theirs and that's what brewed in their hearts and yeah we may think to ourselves man that wrathful angry person is cruel and outrageous but the bible says this who's able to stand before envy <laughs> who's able to stand before the wrath the anger the cruelty that is capable that is within the heart of somebody that is Envious, somebody that desires something that's not, or something that is covetous, is a, is a similar type of an action. Envy festers in the unsatisfied heart of men. But the Bible records, and we should heed this, because this is how the world reacts. They're envious, and this is why they work, and they labor, and they toil, and they try to get, and they try to steal, beg, borrow, do whatever they can to get more, get more, get more, get more. But the Bible records that godliness with contentment is great gain. There is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his own works, for that is his portion. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Be happy with the portion that you have. Be content with the position that you're in. And be godly while you're there. And that is the gain that Christians need to seek after. Gaining in godliness. Gaining in satisfaction with all that God has provided for you. But the world has that unsatisfied, unthankful, unmerciful heart that always drives them to envy. And who's able to stand before envy? But if we're going to continue reading down in verse 5, it says, The fool foldeth his hands together 
and eateth his own flesh. Better is an handful with quietness than both the hands full with travail and vexation of spirit. Amen. So one for desire for more when he hath nothing, because covetousness and envy isn't just reserved to the poor or to the rich. Every man, every heart of man has that within it, and it needs to be harnessed and pressed down. So one, being the foolish one, foldeth his hands together and eateth his own flesh. He has nothing, and yet he's going to eat even that which would carry what he has. He's destroying even the vessel, his hands, that would be able to accept something by the hand of God, were they to be just content to receive of it, were they willing to work for it. The fool has done these things. And then the statement here is made, it says, then both hands full with travail and vexation of spirits. And this is what the fool desires. He's folding his hands together as if hoping that there would be fullness within both those fists he could bring it to his mouth. But since there's nothing there, he eats his very flesh. He eateth his own flesh. Now, the Bible says in verse 6, better is an handful with quietness than to fill those hands. So had the fool recognized that it's enough to just have one of those hands full, perhaps extending that to the Lord, it would be full and he would be satisfied therewith. But they're never satisfied. They're implacable when it comes to these things. And we can adopt this same type of spirit within us. It is better to have one hand full. It is better to quietly enjoy what you have than fighting and envying and striving to fill both through even right works, and even travail, your hands. So even though you're doing the right work, even though you're doing the right type of travail, that it says in verse 4, if you're doing it with the wrong attitude, you're destroying yourselves. You're filling, or trying to fill both your hands. And the better part is to just fill one. This world is cutthroat, right? This world is very dog-eat-dog. -dog. And I never experienced it more than when I, when I, when I lived in Edmonton and saw such a great gap between the rich and to the poor where, where literally you're, you're either you're either like an oil guy and you just have this like million dollar house or you're just dead broke poverty and I tried to like tread the middle but but minimum wage or, or even a little bit better than that was just not enough to suffice I had to give up on that city but that city is one of many that has that same kind of culture divide and it gets the reputation of stab city because people are so poor and desperate and uh, they can't even afford a handgun I guess or, or whatever but it becomes very literally cutthroat where a man in the streets will cut you in order to get um, what he needs from you in order to get ahead instead of folding his hands together he desires that both would be there and he will actually destroy or take lives there's nothing worse to me I mean in, in my rationality of this I think it's more impersonal and probably easier for someone to pull a trigger and to kill somebody but to actually take a knife and a cold blood when you can feel the person in their presence and you're with with them while they die while they suffer there's a there's a more cruel and a wicked heart to that that, that could do such a thing it's just it's, it's hard to fathom it's hard to realize but that's the state of our world and as the gap between the rich and the poor gets bigger we're going to see more and more of that this world is cutthroat this world is dog eat dog and we see in this scripture in verse 5 this world is even dog eat self because men have not grasped the truth that is being demonstrated here in Ecclesiastes. This is why these things are so. This is why we live in a world that is so cutthroat, so dog-eat-dog, -dog, is because the truths that are constrained here, the truths that are being presented here by Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes, the preacher, they haven't grasped it. What is that truth? Well, the great truth is that this life is vain. Therefore, be content with what you have and rejoice in it. When it comes to this world, if everyone were just content with what they had and rejoiced in it, I'm not saying they all have to be Bible-believing Christians, but if people were just happy with what they had, people weren't always coveting more, desiring more, envying others that have more than them, the Bible does record here that when it comes to being compared to wrath and anger, someone having envy is actually a worse thing. Who can stand before the envious? And yet this whole world is bent towards promoting envy. When you turn on the television, when you walk up the streets, when you have your flip phone, your, your smartphone open, right? When you do all these things, you're constantly being hit and inundated with advertisements that promote getting more and more and more, bigger, better, faster, stronger. You're programmed to be envious. 
And this is a sad state that we're living in where people are full of that thing, which the Bible records is actually worse than wrath. It is worse of an emotion than anger, envy. And so Solomon here becomes depressed in this state, and, and no wonder. He starts to think that it, it were better to have none of this life. And Solomon's coming from the position that he has lived on both perspective, both sides of these things, willingly of himself. Verse 7 says, Then I returned and saw vanity under the sun. There is one alone, and there is not a second. Yea, he hath neither child nor brother, yet is there no end of all his labors. Neither is his eye satisfied with riches. And that was the endeavor that Solomon tried to pursue in Ecclesiastes chapter 2. He tried to fill himself up with riches to know the end of man, to understand how men work, how men operate, to achieve to the highest level of all that eye can be satisfied with, all that ear can be filled with, all that belly can be satisfied with. He tried to fill up all those things. And those men are out there even today, those that are alone. Those that don't have child or brother, there is no end to their labor. They're working, they're toiling, they're always trying to get more. Yet they're never satisfied with their riches. Neither they say this statement, neither, they, neither saith he, For whom do I labor and bereave my soul of good? This is also vanity, yea, it is a sore travail. And that's a great question to ask yourself. And that's what Solomon eventually did ask. He asked that question, remember when he said, What shall I leave this to? Shall my son after me be wise, or shall he be a fool? Yea, this is also vanity and vexation of spirit. He come to the realization that all that he was gathering in his endeavors was going to be just left to whoever. And therefore he asked that question, For whom do I labor and breathe my soul of good? For whom am I doing this? Who am I doing this for? Now, if you're to look in verse 9... Instead of being one alone that is questioning and wondering, who am I working for? Instead of being that lady who's out there, you know, getting her career before she later thinks about getting married and having children. Instead of that man that is climbing the corporate ladder and he has no time to settle down and to have a family and to do sorts of things because those are abhorrent in their eyes. Instead of being one alone, you need to be the one that has that great Reward. Verse 9 says this, it says, Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. When the question was asked of Solomon, for whom do I labor? Now it's not for the inheritor, but he's presenting the wisdom that it should be for those who I love, for those who I can enjoy the fruits of the labor with now. And you continue reading, it says, For if they fall, verse 10, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him. Again, if two lie together, then they have heat. But how shall one be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. What Solomon is saying, it's not good to be that one. Two are better than than being that one. Remember when we saw that the oppressed and the oppressor, those ones that are bosses and those ones that are laborers, those ones that are rich and those ones that are poor, had something in common. They had no comforter. So that one who is one alone, doesn't have child, doesn't have brother, he's not satisfied therewith. And that can be a poor person, that can be a rich person. They're both not satisfied and so they're laboring and they're laboring, trying to get more. More, they're full of envy of what someone else has. They're climbing that ladder, they're trying to reach the pinnacle of this world. And they never ask themselves that question, well, what am I even working for? Who am I working for? Because they continue to be blinded by the gain that they're seeking after in this world. They have no comforter. They can't be satisfied. There is nothing, there's no end to that mentality. There's no end to that attitude. And yet, verse 10 shows that the two have help. The two have heat. And even better, those two have heritage. So what's, what's the contrast happening here? It's that the one alone that is seeking after the lusts of the flesh, lusts of the eyes, pride of life, trying to fill his gullet and satisfy himself with all that this world has to offer, it, it is the worst when compared to what is better, and that is being two that have a threefold cord that's not quickly broken. The desire is that there would be people pairing up. I think the context here suggests 
a husband and a wife, right? The threefold cord being the child that adds to that cord so that the whole is not quickly broken. And that family unit, which is the exact opposite and in contrast to the mentality of the one that is greedy of gain, that is after filthy lucre, that is trying to labor and labor and work and work and toil and toil in order that he would achieve more on this earth. The contrast is, and what is better, is that there would be a family unit. That if one falls, the other will pick him up. That if one is cold, the other will help him be warm. That if one is attacked and hurt, the other will protect them. And they will be helped, heated, and even better, will have heritage. So why in this life do we, are we so bent on oppressing, biting and devouring one another, travailing to fill both these hands, when we should leave one hand open in order that we might share? And that's what that, that picture is to me. It pictures that some have nothing, and so they'll eat their own hands, they'll ruin their own lives to get two hands full. Those with two hands full, vexation, travail, their spirit destroyed and crushed. Those with one hand full and one hand empty are able to outstretch the hand of fellowship, are able to pick up their brother, are able to love those that are with them, are able to defend those that are harming those that they love, are able to share of what they have in that other hand. The second hand is free in order that it could have fellowship with the other. And the Bible is clear that two are better. Not two hands full, but one handful and the other to bring another. And look what happens when I grab a hold of my wife's hand and I have one handful and she has one handful of the blessings of God. Hey, now we got two hands full, don't we? And now if Caleb is added to that, he puts his hand on there. Hey, we got three hands full. And even though his hand is just a little hand, now we have a threefold cord that is not quickly broken. And all that comes by way of the area of contentment and being satisfied with what you have and you grow and you increase and you're strengthened when you take of what you have and you share it with another. And like I said, that one man who is endeavoring to be rich, he may have two hands full, but I have two and a half hands full, right? I have two hands plus a little hand. And when more children come, hey, I got more hands and more hands and more hands and riches and blessing beyond because I have been satisfied to be within the confines of God's proper purpose for me, where that is nothing better than I should rejoice in my own works, endeavor to have that portion, and be yoked up with a second. Two are better than one, because that's where the good reward for your labor lies. And when that question is asked, for whom do I labor for? Why do I go to work for 50 hours a week? Why do I travel all across America for five whole days? Why am I working so hard? It's not just to fill my gullet or to fill both my hands. No, it's because I want to provide for my second, provide for my wife, and provide for my child. It is better reward of my labor to do that, and the dividends increase. That's just good investment, right? Because we keep adding handfuls of blessing as the children come. Children are inheritance to the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward, right? I am increasing the more and the more. And Lord willing, when I get super old and I can't take, my, take care of myself, one of my children will then change my diapers just like I change theirs, right? There is the full fruition of all of the blessings and the riches. That's a good investment. Because what is the end of those that fill both hands? Eventually they just get too weak, they can't hold them up. And like the Bible says here, who's going to lift them up when they fall? Who's going to keep them warm when they're cold? Who is going to help them when they are harmed, hurt, and attacked? If they have nobody, they've got nothing. That's what happens to those that are greedy of gain, greedy of what this life has to show. So there is no end to the vanity that is under the sun. It's pointless, it's empty, there's, there, there's nothing good in pursuing after what this world has to offer. And yet the Bible is suggesting here that there is a great reward of my same labors, though I might be doing that same travail, though I might be doing that same right work, like it says in verse 4. If I'm doing it, I'm not envying my neighbor, but I'm doing it instead of acquiring more. I'm requiring to help my spouse, help my family, grow them, grow my love, grow my bond with them, increase them, take care of them, and have us together become an increase unto God of his further blessings. If I do that, then suddenly the reward is increased. So we're chasing after 
vanity when we're seeking after what this world has to offer. Right? The whole creation is of dust. Dust thou art, and dust shall return. Like it said in verse 3, or chapter 3. And so that man that has empty hands, he has no dust. And he's just seeking to fill his hands with dust. And when he has two hands full of dust, what shall the end be? He can't hold any more than what he can hold. And so it spills out, and the Bible records that he becometh poor, as it says in verse 14. The one that has two fists full of dust is spending his entire life laboring and vexing his own soul, trying to pursue and trying to hold, trying to build bigger barns, have bigger hands. Maybe he's going to manufacture a glove so he can hold more dust. But the end is it's was dust, it is dust, it shall be dust. There's no use to it. There's vanity to it. And yet, like I said, if I have one hand full of that same old dust, but I have something better, and that's that threefold cord, that's that increase of God, that's the fruit of my labor being the fruit of my womb, the increase, the fact that I've benefited someone else's life, that's the good reward for your labor. In this life, and if you look at verse 13, it says this. It says, Better is a poor and wise child than an old and foolish king who will no more be admonished. So better are you to begin this life as a poor and wise child. And what does a wise child do? Just like, just like uh, Solomon did. He asked for more wisdom that he could lead, that he could grow unto the position that God would have him to be in. In this life, if you are a child that is admonishable, you are correctable, you are growing, you are willing to learn, willing to be taught, you have a much better position to begin this life right than those that have great fists full of vanity. And you can grow up into that. Impoverished is where the old foolish king ends up. Like it says in verse 14, For out of prison he cometh to reign, whereas also he that is born in his kingdom becometh poor. So that's that old foolish king. That's that old foolish king that can't be admonished anymore. He becometh poor. He loseth that which he had already had, that which he had grown in. But rather the young child who is wise can come up out of the prison. He can come out of what the worst of situations and grow and reign within that. We need to be different as Christians. We need to be hard workers travailing in the right work. Sometimes we go to the exact same job as someone who is envious of gain goes to. Sometimes we toil in the exact same labors as someone who has the wrong mentality, who is growing a kingdom with. And sometimes even at these same jobs, we'll see that person grow and get, get promoted and get raises and continue to grow in those things. And it can be in us to get envious. But we need to be content with the job we have, be hard working, and do it right. Do it proper. Do it to the end that we could help out, have the right motive in order to encourage and strengthen and grow and support our family. For two are better than one. How often do you see these young guys up and coming in the workplace trying to get ahead and trying to labor to be promoted within the ranks of the job? And yet the Christian ought to be just hard working, happy with the fistful that he has in that same work and be content there with and don't let uh, don't let envy creep up in you uh, we need to have that right motive we need to have enough and we need to share what is overwhelming what is above that and that's why uh, the Bible often talks about the blessings that, that pour out right when when I have enough and my hand is full and it starts pouring out well now I can take of what is abundant and share it with others and we need to do that we're not to be that one alone. We're not to be that one that is seeking his own. We're not to be that one that is lifting himself up, trying to promote himself. Promotion cometh from the north. God is the one that giveth promotion to anyone. And unfortunately for some of these ladder climbers in the corporate world, they are climbing and receiving promotion unto destruction. The end of them will be that same. So we don't need to be caught up in this trap whereby we oppress when we are more powerful. Seeing our oppression is something that we want to overcome and we want to then push down somebody else and getting in that rent. There's just a, a promotion we heard about. Don't use that promotion to be a stepping stone to put other people down. Use it rather to benefit your loved one, benefit your family. Two are better than one. Don't use it to gratify self. We don't need to be those that oppress. There is no end to the amount of people 
that fall into the category of oppressors. Verse 15, I considered all the living which walk under the sun with the second child that shall stand up in his stead. There is no end of all the people, even of all that have been before them. They also that come after shall not rejoice in him. Surely this also is vanity and vexation of spirit. There is no end to the amount of people that live this envious, bitter, seeking one's own lifestyle. Christians, we need to be different. We don't need to follow after the ways of the world. We need to be content with what we have. We need to use what God has blessed us with in order that we can help others. Like I said, this illustration works best, I believe, when the two are better than one is a family, a husband and a wife, and the child being that threefold cord not easily broken. But if we're not in that position, or if the children have grown up, or if that time has passed, we can still be two that are better than one. How do we do that? We take what's abundant in our lives, and instead of filling the other fist, we use that to share. We use that to encourage. We use that to be a blessing. We use that to help and to sustain and to bless other people out of the abundance of what we have. Be content with it. If you increase, bless somebody else. And that way our hearts stay right, our hearts stay focused. I've heard often these stories, and only half of them are probably true, but you hear of these great people that in their lives, these testimonies of people that they became like a vehicle for, or, or a throughway, an overpass maybe, of finances to other people. Where they were content to have this much, they wanted God to bless them financially in order that they would just be a vehicle whereby they could bless others. And I've heard of people that spend their entire life simply receiving money from God that they could give or receiving money from God that they can give it. Well, that mentality doesn't happen to everybody because most of the world would receive a big fat paycheck and be like, mine. Well, maybe God's purpose in giving a raise was that the extra that you didn't need last month that you have now was so that you would distribute so that you'd be willing to communicate it. You'd be willing to give it. You'd really be do unto others. You'd be willing to be that vessel unto honor. And I've heard of people, I've known people that have received, you know, you know, I really needed a hundred dollars, Lord, and they get two hundred and they take that hundred and give it. Next thing you know, God's given them three hundred bucks, four hundred bucks, whatever it is, there's an excess come to them, but they understood that they only need so much and they were content with what they had and thereby they became a vehicle whereby they could bless others. I know a few people in my lives that literally money will be just laid on their lap and they just receive it and with the same open hands give it to a ministry, give it to someone in need, give it to somebody, right? And, and it's not just finances, it's just taking what is excess, taking what is given to us above and beyond what we need and using it to benefit others and that's the mentality that Christians need to be having. There's enough people in this world. There is no end of all the people who seek to please self and to grow and be promoted to glorify self. We need to seek to promote God, glorify Him, and as He promotes us, use what's above and beyond our means and what we need to be a vehicle, a vessel unto honor, to give unto others, hoping never to receive again. I believe that's uh, the gist, I believe, of what's being taught here. Don't be one that oppresses. Don't be an oppressor. Don't be seeking to gain. Don't be seeking to take the travail and the right works that you do, envying others as if that you would fill both hands and increase and grow in that. It is better to learn. Two are better than one. Share the good reward for your neighbor, and then you receive something even better. You receive help. You receive heat. You receive an heritage. And those things are priceless. Father, I think